All right, so we talk a little bit about uh, let's talk a little bit about fears. Uh, our fears, and we all have fears, but certain types of fears that we have prevents us uh, from making a strong connection, to make a connection with new people. And sometimes those fear cause us uh, to avoid, try to prevent feelings of love. And you can develop love to someone, so somebody new. Uh, and when, but when that when that that happens, when you actually so-called all of a sudden developing f feelings of love towards someone, or you developing somehow a new relationship with a person, all of a sudden anxiety so-called takes over and many times forces us, and most of the time though, is a in a subconscious matter, to end this, uh, this relationship uh, before the relationship moves to the next level. Okay? I'm sure we can all think about different examples from our own personal interaction and experience or other people uh, in terms of that. And uh, forces us to finish this, uh, this relationship and you know, that's why people have a problem forming a relationship. You know, people go on certain dates, let's say X amount of dates, and some, some, most of the time they break it very early and sometimes even get to near engagement or engagement and then pow, it's all over. Okay, so it's a phenomenon. We'll see, we'll see what happened. Uh, uh, this, this, this uh, in, in a very quite, let's say, in an instinctive manner, right? You know, this is a quite of a, of a almost an accurate, let's say, uh, description of what uh, what is called and lately is called uh, fear of commitment or commitment phobia. We love phobias, right? So, fear of, of uh, fear of commitments or commitment phobia. People who suffer from that fear or from that phobia cannot maintain, cannot stay in a single relationship for a long period of time. Uh, well, they, while they do or are able to feel feelings of love, but the intensity of those feelings that they feel many times scares them. So a person, for example, has a problem having a relationship, he feels love, and then he loves that person, he has feeling towards that person, and then all of a sudden, they get cold feet. What does it mean they get cold feet? They get they are afraid of the of the of the intensity of the feelings that they feel towards that person, and by the intensity of those of those uh, of those feeling, now we triggered a little anxiety, right, and that just increases the anxiety that was already there dormant, and we'll see why that 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 makes it more magnified. And then they develop another fear, which is the fear of losing control and maybe even losing themselves within that relationship. And it's something that it's becoming more and more. And by the way, by the way, this is not about the shit of crisis of the free world. This is worldwide. This is true also for secular people. This is true and accurate even for non-religious people. And not Jewish people. Don't think that religious Jewish people is a phenomenon by itself. As I explained to you previously, previously on, <laughs> as it's, it's, we live within the world. So whatever happens in the world, we're experiencing ourselves. Yes, with a certain religious, Jewish religious filter, but it, it, it affects our lives as well. Don't think that we are living in, you know, some kind of like, I don't know, Galapagos Island, you know, developing mm -hmm. this. Uh, we are people of, of this society. As much as we would like to deny that, 
you know, religious people sometimes like to deny the fact. They think we're like turtles in Galapagos Island waiting for Darwin to, to, you know, to discover us. No, we are just like anybody else. Just the way we interpret that is in a, in a, in a manifestation that is really Jewish religious life. But the, the same process that happened in the world happened to us. There's nothing, nothing to... Uh, even when it comes to the big dream about getting married. Now everybody to get married. Ooh, it's a big dream of getting married. Milestone of your life to getting married, right? Uh, you're not going to find a big contradiction on that matter when it comes to that. Even in regards to the big big dream of getting married, uh, it's, it's going to be present as well. So people that, uh, that are afraid of commitment most definitely could declare upon themselves that they are dreaming to get married one day. They really, I really want to get married. I do. I dream about it. But I'm not, I'm not ready. <laughs> or for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. You know, how many times I have heard that. And I hope everybody that, yeah, knows what I'm talking to. Not you guys, this. If you know what I mean. I heard it so many times. Yes, I'm, I'm, I want to one day, so on and so forth. However, that fear that floods them, that anxiety that floods them, prevents them from if even entering a relationship. If the, if the fear is so great, if the fear is so great, many times they wouldn't even enter a relationship. But even if they're able to break this and to penetrate into a relationship, that fear is overwhelming to them and they will not be able to maintain that relationship for a long period of time. Let's say they are in a relationship, and now there is pressure on them, and now they're—I hate to use the word partner because it's not—it sounds like very like you know—but they're the other part, the other part. Okay, fine, let's call it the partner. Oh yeah, the dirty word, partner. Is that four-letter word? Okay, it's a four-letter word. It starts with a P. Yeah, partner. Uh, ask them to really, you know, listen. Where are we going with this relationship? I hate—I mean, I see it all the time. Couples. I mean, a dating, it, it's so wrong. It is so wrong, first of all, to date for a long, for a long period of time. Even when you're not, a, you're not a religious Jew or a Jew or religious at all, it is wrong to date for a long time. Because then the relationship is kind of undefined. You don't know what, what the heck you're doing with it. So why change? And then usually they break, right? But I hear it many times of people who are dating and then, okay, now the other side is starting to put a pressure. Know what's going on with this? Oh, you know, are we going to move? You know, the, so there is pressure. There's the fear from here, and now the other side is putting the pressure on them uh, to define where to understand. Listen, where are we standing with this? I want to understand where are we standing with this relationship? Is it do or die? Is it uh, make or break? Or you know, whatever you want to call this. Uh, most chances that the, uh, that the people who are afraid of commitment, those people who suffer from the commitment phobia, uh, would rather break the relationship and to, you know, like a disengage, like a, you know, like a dog fight, you know. And it feels like the guy is on his tail. No, 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 I'm locking on you, right? And then uh, disengage, he doesn't, you know, break like this. You know, this is exactly like this, top gun, you know. Take my breath away, Shh. breaks away, right? And don't make it, they would rather break, than disengage, than engage. Uh, in other words, in other words, they would rather, they would rather be somewhat dishonest with themselves Rather than to say, listen, let's, let's be honest with myself. I have, I have fears. I feel in certain fears. And I need to learn to deal with them. So they would never admit to their fears. And then by doing so, not being fair and honest with themselves. Then to say, listen, I have a problem. I got to do something about it. And that's, that happens all the time. Besides, if we, if we, let me see how far we are. Uh, okay, fine. Besides, if we, if we, in the past, we used to talk about, uh, you know, we used to talk about fear of commitment as something that is completely unique to men, males, you know, men. Because 
you know, they used to say it's the fear of man to commit himself to, the, you know, the Darwinism of the thing. Man lives short, you know, they're all there to multiply, so his fear of dying causes him to, you know, to have uh, as many women as he can and so on and so forth. He's, therefore, he's afraid to commit himself to one, uh, to one woman for all their life and so on and so forth. Today, the story is not the same. Researchers already understand that there's no difference whatsoever between male and female in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that matter. And by the way, I mean, since we're talking about this, let's talk about it. This is true also, interestingly enough, again, this is not a promotion for, for such a behavior, but nevertheless, it's, it's present just as much in a homosexual relationship between men and men and women and women in terms of their fear to make a commitment. Don't think that over there in that, that part of the world is like, oh, lovey dovey, everything is fine. Ah, they have the same problem also. So you see that it has nothing to do with culture, it has nothing to do with gender, and it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It has to do with something that is in your head, and it's much deeper than that. I don't see where it's coming from. Uh, people with that uh, phobia of commitment might have a might confuse and mix up uh, positive feelings, right? Like, for example, excitement over a new relationship, going out with a new person, it's exciting, you know, it's, it's searching and finding out and so on and so forth, together with negative feelings of fear. They might, that, that line that defines, you know, being excited over something positive with anxiety, that line is kind of blurry. They're not quite, they feel something. They don't know how to compartmentize that, that feeling and to categorize the feeling. So, oh no, this is not anxiety. This is actually, I'm happy about this, right? Let's say, for example, you're going on a trip, right? Most people are going on a trip, oh, excited. The unknown, I'm excited. There's a little fear, but you know, but for them, every unknown is like putting in a dark room with, with the hearing noises of the unknown. That's, so they just don't know how to you know, define it. It's a problem of definition. Uh, furthermore, researchers claim that the, the reasons for that fear of commitment is, is as broad as there are people who suffer from that. In other words, it's not just like one, two, and three. A different, different uh, uh, fine-tuning and nuances of, of the reason for that fear. However, there are certain common denominators which they do have. Uh, when you try to look for this, therefore, common denominator, you feel many people who would testify that they had experienced in their past a problematic relationship. You know, that they had a problematic relationship. Could be an abusive relationship. Could be a relationship with a person who is a passive aggressive or, or any kind of a problematic relationship in the past or that they have very close friends that they could associate themselves with that person, that that person had actually a relationship with As a result of that, they, prevent, they themselves prevent themselves from that. Uh, and because their best friend or whoever, the person that they were close to, share them with that, that develop with them the same feeling of, of identification, right? They are identifying with that person as if they were the, it was them, okay? So that's that's... That's uh, something that really stood up from that. Uh, other other uh, markers that are common for people who suffer from fear of commitment uh, would include a fear that this relationship uh, would end without any 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 warning and will end immediately without any warning. All of a sudden, you you think you have something. All of a sudden. Boom, uh, honey, you know what? I don't uh, like you anymore, and goodbye and good luck, you know? Uh, a fear to er enter a relationship that is not the right relationship for you, right? So people are afraid. So they can make the decision. So they, because they feel that they don't have the, po the tools to properly enter a relationship, maybe they're gonna make a bad decision, so therefore they make no decision. Uh, many people, uh, have the fear of a relationship that is going to end up by somebody taking advantage of them or somebody abounding them. 
like leaving them alone, you know, all of a sudden like this, hanging loose. It's very interesting. Sometimes people, because of a lot of social pressure, and then you will find, you will find more in more culture uh, oriented, you know, family oriented cultures, let's say for example, Jewish communities and so on and so forth, Chinese communities, Indian communities and so on, that the family pressure or the expectation of the family is great. No, no, you're getting married, you're dating, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with you? They would enter a relationship that's going to end up in disaster just to take the pressure off because they don't want to be in a relationship. So it's, it's kind of an oxymoron. I don't want to be in a relationship, so I'm going to enter a relationship that's going to fail to begin with because of that pressure. And you will see the contributors of, of, of such things. You see it all the time. You pick up those impossible relationships with people that you know are not for you, just to say, listen, you know, that's not for me here. The reason is that. All the time. I can think about, I mean, on the spot, about seven different cases that I can think of right now. But I won't, I won't tell you. About seven different cases like this. It's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, other problems are problems with uh, trust. They have a problem trusting people. Uh, lack of ability to trust on your spouse and so on and so forth and various uh, childhood traumas uh, that cause uh, problems with, uh, with uh, you know, or later on with forming a relationship and many times different dynamics that were destructive dynamics with parents that goes all the way back to your childhood. Regarding the last one, I mean, we can talk about each and every one of them, you know, separately, but I just want to bring the point about the last one, because I see it a lot. There was an Israeli researcher, her name is Dr. Sharon Dekel. She is a psychologist and she is a researcher for social work in Tel Aviv University. And she did a research, it was a fascinating research, you should, you know, do a search and try to find, find it. Uh, she found it a common denominator from people who have phobia of a commitment or to establish a relationship, that fear establish a relationship, it is really stems from the first relationship that which they had with their, the first relationship that they had in general, which is the relationship they had with their parents. Okay? Uh, or should I say with the wrong relationship that they had with their parents. That later on, later on, that dynamics in the relationship with the parents came to, to in, as an expression or express itself as a parenthood that is very nosy, very, you know, uh, uh, controlling for one side or the complete opposite for that, uh, a, a parenthood that did not, did not get involved a lot or show uh, lack of caring and therefore, as a result, they were, were not so-called present in, the, in, the, in raising their children. So there's two extremes. Over-controlling parents and under-controlling parents. Uh, her theory is based on the, on the fact is that during the time of pressure, and especially when we fall under pressure, Children, and uh, children, you're always going to be a child. You know, you're always going back to something. That's why it's very important to acquire proper habits for kids to begin with. For example, parents who are, you know, mothers, especially mothers for whatever. Sometimes it's mothers. Oh, mother, but mothers are oh, nothing like a mother. Mother is a wonderful thing. However, sometimes mothers destroy their child. Okay, destroy them, especially if they have a weak father. That's, that's a catastrophe. Catastrophe. They, they, they would not let the kid, I don't know, sneeze outside alone, but they will give the kid, they will buy the kid the most fancy, or they're allowed to buy a fancy car. It's just, it's just like this, it's, it's crazy how people control, and sometimes mothers control the, parent, the children to, a, to a complete destruction. Complete destruction. Complete. Needless to say that... Uh, you know, lack of, lack of uh, figures, appropriate figures in the family. Today, and many times you cannot trust researchers today, it depends, unless they're really good. But many times today, it's a, it's a, the research is driven by lobbies, not by true science. But many times the lack of an appropriate uh, 
healthy figure at home, like a father figure, will cause the child to look for this father figure somewhere else, if you know what I mean. Or an over-controlling mother to do the same thing. We need balance. So, so uh, when we have pressure, many times children try to get closer, near their parents, in order to receive from them a proper emotional support. And it is, and it's true when you were eight years old, or when you twenty years old, or thirty years old, or forty, or fifty, or sixty, and so as long as your parents are around. So when you are under pressure, you always try to get your parents' attention. And many times, many times, the behaviors, the patterns that got you your parents' attention at the time will surface up at the times of pressure. And if there were negative patterns or behavior, that's how you your parents did not pay attention to you. And your only way you got attention from your parents and when you act like a lunatic, okay? So now when there is pressure and you want your parents' attention again, you're gonna act like a lunatic all over again. You're gonna be the same eight-year-old that and you're repeating your patterns all over again. You want your parents' attention all over again. So when we have times of, uh, of pressure, we want to ask the appropriate attention from the parents. And when the parents is not present, or, in other words, not present in terms of he doesn't care, oh, do break your head. Or, when the parents is overly involved in the child's life, the child simply learns uh, to skip that and uh, try to you know, try to avoid it. And then, but later on, times of pressure, coming back to it again. Okay? Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it, you see how much the, how much appropriate parenting is really important for the future of the children. That's why I keep telling you all the time, bringing children is not a sport. It's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. And when your relationship is not yet settled, you know, in terms of you're just getting married, you know, nobody wants to listen, but I think you should wait a little bit before you rush to have a kid. Because you don't know how to yet live with this relationship. You will did not let this relationship grow and develop as an entity by itself so therefore when problems are going to come and usually they're going to come usually problems and we're going to maybe talk about it in the future problems with raising children after the first child you have about four years of readjustment because it's a new thing you know that's a lot of people get divorced so bring in this you're going to go back to your old habits you're going back to your old habits. So therefore, it doesn't make a difference how this fear comes to manifest, uh, manifest itself. Or the reason, or the main reason that causes this, researchers tell us that it's very important to speak about that and to speak about the issue of uh, not getting married even at, at quite of an old age, you know. Uh, today, it's not abnormal to to be single, 30s and mid 30s, 40s by all means it's a little it's a little pushing, but it becomes a problem. Because to a certain extent, let's look at it this way. For 40 years you lived alone. Now you're gonna share your life with somebody else and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Or now you're gonna have a child. When you listen, I was 40 years old one time. Okay? And I was a father when I was 40, and I was a father when I was 30, and I was a father when I was 35, and I was a father when I was 28. It's not the same. It's not the same. So when you're 40 years old, you don't have the same dynamics in you to become a father as you were, you know, 25, 26, 30. It's not the same thing. Uh, that fear of commitment also would come from, in many times, from, as we said, long, you know, elderly age. When people get old, not elderly, you know, older age. When people become older, where we decide to, okay, let's tie the knot and let's give up when, you know, what craziness that we had in our heads and we get married. And many times there's more and more single people, whether they're in the 20s or the 30s or even in the 40s, 
enjoy the freedom that society gives you of being single, and the fear of losing that freedom is very real and, 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 and exists with all of us. However, one needs to remember when you have a good relationship and it's a good and truthful relationship, you're not going to feel like you're losing anything, including your freedom. It's going to be something good. So it's good that I got married. I don't feel like I'm restrained at all. But when your relationship is unhealthy, you're going to feel that you, are, you lost something and then... You know, you, you know what happens. You know, if a man feels like he lost his freedom and his uh, wife chopped him and turned him from a, uh, from a bull into an ox, right? If you know what I mean, right? So he's going to go and find his bullism somewhere else and he's going to be cheating on his wife and the other way around. And that's what happens all the time. And, and, and believe me, many stories of what they call in the thing desperate housewife exist in the religious world as well. It's all for the same reasons. So I'm going to tell you something, guys. If you have fears, admit to them and do something about it. Seek help. There's nothing wrong with that. Also, before you get married, if you decide, let's say you engage, I think it's a very good idea to go three or four times to a, three times, it's fine, more than enough, to go to a marriage counselor to teach you how to deal with the problems if and when they'll rise, because they will rise. So you know how to, you're equipped with tools. And even more important, when you're a parent, please, don't be a yenta, don't be like this Jewish mother who doesn't let her kid do anything. And he needs to control him. He's 18 years old. She's going to determine where he's going to go on vacation. And where he's not going to go on vacation. When he's 18 years old, she's going to determine where he's going to go to school or where he's not going to go to school. If it's okay for him to take a haircut or it's not okay for him to get a haircut. Right? Mothers like that are destructive to the children. Parents like that are destructive to the children as well where the child does not have any room to grow, and then we have bonsai kids, because they're very restricted in their, in their growth. The, the root system is not well developed. It might look like a tree, but it's just a bonsai. We have bonsai kids. And as a result of that, we're going to have bonsai fruit and bonsai other parts, and everything is very small. And yet, on the other hand, you cannot be a parent who doesn't care what the kid does, come and goes, whatever he wants, without giving an account. Parenting is a very, very, very demanding job. In one hand, you have to give your kids the freedom to grow, to make decisions, to fail, to help them correct it, to make mistakes. I shouldn't say fail, to make mistakes and correct them. On the other hand, on the other hand, you know, you can let the kid do whatever he wants and don't ask him. He needs to give an account and be responsible for his actions. A parent should not get involved where his son or daughter goes to school. Listen, if you want argument sake, you want my son, you want to go to Harvard, go to Harvard. I cannot pay you. Argument sake, how much is Queen's College? I don't know, $3,000 a semester. I can contribute to you how much is that. You know, the rest, if you want, take loans, honey. I don't have to pay for it. When a kid comes demanding from his parents to go to those Ivy League schools, especially for undergraduate. The parents are doing the wrong thing from giving the kid the money, even if the father has the money, because you don't show him a responsibility. If the kid, and you don't give him an effort to try, if the kid will have to, let's say the kid wants to go to NYU, for whatever reason he wants to go to NYU, or Columbia, or one of those uh, schools, uh, you know, for schools that cost you about, I don't know, thirty, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, and you can only pay, let's say $10,000 a year. Well, let the kid take the loans, and then he will probably have to work hard, you know, not to fail because he took loans. So you see, you giving him freedom, you tell him where you want to do it, go ahead and do it. I can only do this. So these controlling parents, and yet parents will let the kid come, whatever, they let the parent come and go, whatever, the kid go, whatever you want, do whatever he wants. And go to. These are parents that also destroy the kid. As a result of that, the kid develops problems and developing a relationship and making something which is more important, commitment, commitment. 
And that's, uh, that's the state of affair that we have. So if you see your kid having problems getting married or face or having, and by the way, commitments, when I'm talking about the fear of commitments, it's not only for you know, wedding and shiduchim and stuff like this, making a commitment to come to learn, making a commitment and forming healthy relationship with a group of people, all right? Yes, you blame the kid, but you should know that as your parent, first of all, it's your fault. It's your fault. So have a nice day.